Okay, on behalf of the PHRN, I'd like to welcome you all to the Linkage Luminaries webinar series. My name is Felicity Flack and I'm the Manager of Policy and Client Services at the PHRN. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of all the lands we are meeting on today and by paying my respects to Elders past and present. Uh, first off, just some housekeeping. If you have any questions today for today's speaker, please type them in the Q&A box and you can do this at any time during the presentation, but we'll answer as many questions as possible at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and we will email you as soon as it's available on our YouTube channel to let you know that you can watch it again if you'd like. Um, but now to our speaker for today, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Julian Troller, uh, who's the Chair of Intellectual Disability Mental Health at the University of New South Wales. And we're very much looking forward to what Julian's got to share with us today. So over to you, Julian. Thank you, Felicity. And it's a special privilege to be with you here today. I'm just in the process of uh, sharing my screen, uh, which I will do. And I hope now that you can see uh, the screen I too would like to acknowledge uh, the traditional custodians on the land uh, that I'm speaking to you from, which is the land of the medical uh, people, the, trust, uh, the traditional custodians of uh, the land on which UNSW stands. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge uh, those who may be listening, uh, who are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples uh, and those who may uh, view the recording later. Thank you for this special privilege it is to be with you today to share information uh, that we've understood about the population health needs of people with neuropsychiatric disorders, partly through our data linkage, but I'd like to put it in its place within a broader uh, framework of translational research. I'd like to acknowledge that uh, this webinar is in fact not about me, it's about uh, work uh, done by a group of people uh, to help support the health needs of people with intellectual or developmental uh, disabilities. Uh, and it fits within a broader program of work uh, on neuropsychiatric disorders um, here at UNSW. These are some of my staff and students. We have a staff and student capacity of about 23 individuals. They're passionate about the work they do. They aren't working at a university because uh, that it's well paid uh, necessarily, but they're working here because they uh, really are really central to this mission that we have to address the health inequalities of particular groups. I'd like to also acknowledge the funding for our data research, which comes from a number of sources. The core funding for our department, in fact, comes from the New South Wales Ministry of Health. And I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to be uh, in a position where I'm thinking through carefully how to build better capacity within services systems to meet the health needs of people with intellectual and developmental disability. But a number of our research projects have very specific funding sources, and some of those are listed here. Today, what I want to be working us through is um, the way in which we've used linked data to understand the health needs of people with neuropsychiatric disorders, but using people with intellectual disability as a case in point and focusing in a more narrow way on uh, that population of need. And I'd like to talk through each of these key points as we go today. Firstly, to context. Some of you may be wondering, what is intellectual disability? It's a lifelong disability with onset during the developmental period, and it's characterized by impaired mental abilities. And arbitrarily, we define that as having an intellectual quotient below 70, and a reduced ability to manage common demands of day-to-day -day life that we term adaptive functioning. And it has a prevalence of about one to 2% in our population. But in fact, the health needs associated with this group far exceed that small percentage of the population. And I'll convince you of that hopefully later. 
I don't pretend to be a data expert. In fact, uh, I'm relatively new to the data science field. But what I do hope to bring to the conversation today is to think about how we can embed data linkage research in a broader, inclusive and mixed methods research program and use that power uh, to, you, to uh, change services systems, to change health policy and to do it better for a group. So we've used it quite powerfully, uh, the results of our research in uh, advocacy and in knowledge translation. I hope to demonstrate that today. And I think that's where our strength lies. Firstly, if I could talk to you about the health disadvantage experienced by people with intellectual disability. And essentially this health disadvantage is lifelong. Our average life expectancy is 81 for women and 85, I think. So 85 for women and 81 for men. But for people with intellectual disability, life expectancy is far reduced. Uh, we know that people with intellectual disability experience premature frailty and death on average at about 54 years of age. And essentially what we have is a population group with a lifelong health disadvantage. And this is really what we're seeking to address in our research. The health needs of people with intellectual disability are many and varied across different parts uh, of the body. And particularly prominent is uh, the mental health needs of this group and the neuropsychiatric uh, needs of the group. But essentially, there are health needs across every bodily system and in every domain of our healthcare services, particularly around access to preventative health care in primary care. But as well, we have supporting the person often family carers or paid disability professionals. Family carers may themselves experience high rates of mental ill health and stress and competing care needs, especially as they age. And formal uh, disability professionals are a transient workforce who lack training in health and how may themselves struggle to support a person to access good health care. So we have our task cut out for us, but we must bear these things in mind as we think how we translate findings from research into change that helps improve the health status of people with intellectual disability. The Royal Commission into Violence, Abuse, Neglect and Exploitation of People with Disability is currently underway. And its recent interim report late last year essentially found that based on the evidence, there has been and continues to be systemic neglect of people with cognitive disability in the Australian healthcare system. This case was substantially built on the health disadvantage experienced by people with intellectual disability. And I've put a link there to the interim report and to some summarised evidence that I put forward to the Disability Royal Commission. So if you're wanting to understand the bigger context here, you can read that. The information in that link uh, for my statement also includes recommendations on how we can do it differently. What about the approach we've taken? Well, firstly, I'd like to say that uh, we have undertaken a very um, strategic response to our task to better equip the health workforce and services systems to uh, meet the health needs of people with intellectual and developmental disability. And you can see the detail of our mission and our vision and our guiding principles and our key domains of work in our strategic plan. But underpinning our approach is the human rights, strong human rights foundation. Some of you will be aware of the UN Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities, which has Article 25 relating to health, which uh, says that we have signed up as a nation to not only um, the aspirations, but also to reporting on measures that we're taking to ensure that all pe persons with disability have access to appropriate healthcare services and that they are of the same range, quality and standard as they are for everybody. But at the moment, as you can see from the Royal Commission's report, we are fall, falling far short of that. Another key component of our approach is interdisciplinary research. I have learned so much from colleagues across other disciplines uh, about how to approach uh, research in this area. And I've uh, been privileged to engage with mixed methods, so broadening my horizon, uh, in terms of mixed methods research, which connects the lived experience of people with disability uh, to the data. And that tells a really powerful story. I've also been uh, really uh, excited by the multi, uh, multiple cross-sector partnerships that we've enjoyed. 
And these have enabled us to really develop trust and connections and to get access to data sets that we may not have otherwise. Uh, our approach has also been one uh, of inclusive research, but this has been a journey. Uh, I think it's hard to uh, fully establish a, an inclusive research focus in a university or clinical context, but slowly, bit by bit, we've been able to improve the way in which we do our research. We are guided then by a lived experience, by the sorts of questions that people with disability themselves want answered and people with disability have a role in shaping uh, the research direction, in knowledge creation, in uh, uh, co-producing the approach to research and telling us what they want done in response to the research findings. And this has been a really powerful element of the uh, translation of the data linkage uh, work into action. As well, our research approach has been one that has had to come to grips with a number of different domains, the basic epidemiology, the understanding of risk factors, the contextual determinants of the health inequality, and has then needed to springboard to formulation and testing of interventions and knowledge transfer. And this is some of the work that we've done just in intellectual disability to date, but our program is broader than that and covers other developmental disabilities such as autism spectrum disorders, uh, it covers uh, uh, other neurological um, and cognitive disorders such as dementia and I'll come to some of those areas later. So what about the enablers of the linked uh, data work? Well firstly I'd have to say one of the core aspects has been funding. A second has been time and there's a significant time lag between when we conceptualise a project uh, and develop the uh, application to access the data and uh, between then and when we actually get uh, our hands on the data itself. So we've had to have a series of projects uh, which um, essentially allow us over time to continue to update um, our research uh, program. This has uh, been a process of great tenacity by the team, uh, has been part of a team effort and has, as I said previously, uh, been one reliant on a strong knowledge translation strategy and key sector partnership. So what about the linkages? One of the key challenges in our area is that no single identifier exists for people with intellectual disability. So if we're trying to understand the health needs of this group, we have our tasks cut out for us. They're not represented in a data set, a single data set. The labeling reasons and conventions vary between data sets. For example, I might uh, be known as a person with a particular disability in the disability services minimum data set and that's for the purposes of accessing funding but I might be known uh, to uh, the prisons uh, uh, setting as a person with disability in order to be provided specific uh, accommodations in that setting and I might be uh, identified in the public guardians data set in order to provide support around decision making in my healthcare. These multiple reasons that people exist in data sets and are labelled as having a particular disability give us the ability to link these data sets into a much more comprehensive population, uh, near population capture of our population of interest. And this is indeed what we did. You can see on the right hand panel from one of our linkages that I'll refer to later as linkage three, these are the data sets uh, in which we identify, we're able to identify people with intellectual disability. Uh, and you can see that there's some overlap in the identifiers, but not complete overlap. So we get some unique components from each of these different data sources that eventually give us a large link data. The total number in this linkage with intellectual disability in New South Wales is just over 92,000 individuals, but it's a much larger linkage cohort consisting of all people with neurological disorders and all people with cognitive disorders and developmental disorders in New South Wales. Our very first foray into linkage was much more modest. As in a proof of concept approach, we obtained access to the disability services minimum data in New South Wales, and we went around to four local health districts and asked whether we could link that data to local health district data related to ambulatory mental health services. And this for us was the first time some years ago now uh, that we were able to demonstrate the power of the use of data um, for this population. 
Our second linkage was much more ambitious and we had a number of different data sets that you can see at the state level, disability services data, the admitted patient data, the ambulatory mental health services data, emergency departments data, uh, prisons data from two sources, the public guardians data, the New South Wales Ombudsman's data, and the Department of Education's disability data set, linked by the Centre for Health Record Linkage, uh, to a number of different data sets looking at exposures and outcomes, including deaths data. And this was a, uh, our next uh, big linkage uh, that has been really helpful for us. And there's a cohort profile paper that I've attached here that you can access. We then updated that linkage to the most recent for the purposes of a large NHMRC partnerships with Better Health Grant uh, with the agencies involved. And this enabled us to really do a lot of um, research looking at the health and mental health needs of people with intellectual disability. We have recently received a data set in the fourth linkage to a Commonwealth data set. So very similar state-based data to the ones that I just mentioned, but now linked to exposure and um, outcome variables of much more significance in, in terms of Commonwealth data sets on prescribing for this group, which is a really important one. Uh, the Medicare benefit schedule, which gives us access to primary care and out of hospital specialist care and some allied health data national bowel screening, can, uh, cancer and immunisation registries, and the national uh, deaths index. So indeed, uh, this is the latest data set we have, uh, which we've just begun to clean. Now I'd point out that at this stage, it looks um, like this is a, a very recent linkage, but in fact, we started work uh, nearly three years ago on this linkage and they're only just receiving the data. In fact, there's some data sets that we still don't quite have deposited. So you can see that there's a huge delay between conceptualization and actual linkage. Uh, if you'd like a bigger graphic, that's what our new linkage looks like. We have also, as part of this linkage, a comparison cohort that's age, sex, and social demographically matched uh, to uh, our cohort with intellectual disability. So this further strengthens our capacity because we can make direct comparisons with this cohort on all sorts of measures, whether it's health services use, health profiles, uh, costs of care and so on, and continuity of care, of course, uh, in the health and mental health sphere. We have a further linkage that we're proposing. We're just finalising the ethics submission for this. And this is a, a much bigger scale project once again, taking our larger cohorts, all people with neurological, developmental or mental health diagnoses, and match controls and linking all of that data at the state level to the relevant Commonwealth data sets. And we're hoping that this will be uh, an even more substantial data platform in which to do a range of different um, uh, analyses that tell us more about the health and well-being of these groups or particular um, focus on uh, particular diagnoses within uh, those groups. You can see the complexity uh, that is evident in this linkage. Uh, and I think that's one thing that I would say that uh, the preparation of such a large linkage and the thinking through and the discussions with both Cheryl and AIHW that need to occur, need to all be factored into the timing uh, and the effort required and the funding required to do this. This has only been possible because of a grant from our own university, which was trying to um, support us establishing this research infrastructure. Well, I've highlighted some of the barriers as we've gone along. This is a complex process with multiple linkages. There are multiple ethics committees, each with their own requirements and multiple data custodians. And of course, even after approval, some data remains inaccessible. So some of the Commonwealth data sets, for example, have changed in the nature of um, data collation and are not yet ready to be released, even though we have ethics approval and we've, we've had uh, lots of data handed over to us already. So even after approval, um, we may not necessarily get access to all of the data that we had hoped, but we certainly have now in that last linkage, a really comprehensive data set. Also with the time lag, we're aware that our data becomes old even uh, when it's new to us. And this is a really major problem. Uh, we, we know that people collect data in the services systems for a particular purpose. So it may not be ready or prepared uh, for researchers such as us to lay our hands on. And the evolution of the data sets means that sometimes the nature of the data or the data shells or 
the data dictionaries need to be changed and updated. And this is also an issue that we've encountered uh, with some recent changes, particularly at the Commonwealth level. And sometimes that means that there's a lag between the data set being constructed and the availability of the description of what's in the data to guide researchers both in their application and in their use of the data. And now, what about the use of the data? What's its utility? We've used the data in the following broad ways, in advocacy to drive changes in health policy for particular populations of interest, to look at health services design and better responsiveness of health services, to build capacity and to be a trigger for the building of capacity where we've shown that there's a gap, uh, and to look at health service and disability service delivery and evaluation more recently in partnership with the Social Policy Research Centre here at UNSW and in workforce development, showing that if there's a gap, then we need to make sure that our health staff are equipped to better meet the health needs of particular groups. Let me give you some tangible examples. Linkage 3 I referred to earlier looks a little like this. Uh, we're able to define uh, within the cohort uh, people with mental health issues, people with neurological disorders, people with intellectual disability, and people with developmental disorders, or you can define them on the basis of the types of services they're using. The linkage itself looks a bit like this. The core domains are essentially health, disability related services, corrections and other types of data. But you can see that overall the linkage is substantial. It contains over 2 million individuals and multiple records. But essentially in the state, we build up a picture uh, of people with neurological diagnoses, mental health diagnoses, people with intellectual disability, or people with other developmental disability labels within those data sets. So it's incredibly powerful potentially. When we look at how people with uh, intellectual disability specifically are represented in our health service use data, we see something really interesting. Mm. Remember I said that about one to 2% of the population have intellectual disability. In this particular illustration, our linkage contains about people with intellectual disability at a population frequency of 1.15%. And let's look at how they're represented in services systems. About 4% of people using emergency departments are people with intellectual disability, yet they're only 1.1% of the population represented in our data set. About 6% of all people using inpatient mental health services or outpatient mental health services are people with intellectual disability yet they're only a small uh, population proportion. We've also looked at um, how people are using uh, inpatient services. We note that the rate of non-mental health admissions uh, is twice that of people without intellectual disability. And those admissions tend on average to be about twice as long. People use emergency departments at uh, twice the rate and at twice the cost. When we looked specifically at mental health admissions, we've seen that people with intellectual disability compared to those without are twice as likely to be admitted, five times as likely to experience ultra long stays and twice as likely to be admitted more than three times a year. And there are some differences uh, between people with and without intellectual disability in terms of their characteristics. And they're uh, understandable in the context of intellectual disability. We've also looked at the impact of intellectual disability after first ever psychiatric admission for any condition. So we've looked at all people experiencing their first ever admission in New South Wales, and then looks at, looked at what's happened to them afterwards. And in this research, we found that after accounting for all other factors at one month, two to five months, and six to 24 months after first admission, intellectual disability was second only to drug and alcohol comorbidity in driving the representation to emergency departments and readmission to hospitals, suggesting an inefficiency of care once a person with intellectual disability is discharged from the mental health context. We've also looked at costs of care within the mental health uh, sphere. And strikingly, as we said before, only 1.15% uh, of the New South Wales population was represented in our data set as having an intellectual disability but we see when we look at inpatient costs uh, in, in mental health service provision, that small proportion uh, with intellectual disability uh, have a very high impact on, this, on the mental health budget. 
14.4% of all of the costs associated with care in New South Wales in this particular financial year were those costs required to meet the inpatient mental health care of people with intellectual disability. And on average across um, the non-admitted sector, that is outpatient treatment and the inpatient treatment, we have an average uh, here of about 12% of all costs in New South Wales in the mental health budget uh, being required by people in, with intellectual disability to meet their needs. So this is a really interesting uh, graph that just illustrates that. 1% of the New South Wales population in our data set, 6% of the users of that service, but 12% of the overall mental health care costs. And it's these kind of figures that I think are really telling because at the moment we don't really have much in the way of specialised services, though they are developing in New South Wales in response to figures like this. Uh, but it tells us that there might be a potential gap. Another key illustration that I'd like to uh, bring to you is uh, when we've looked at uh, mortality and deaths in people with intellectual disability. And I've highlighted uh, three key publications uh, here that uh, uh, illustrate our work in this area. Our key findings are that median age at death in people with intellectual disability is just 54 years. And that compared at the same time in the New South Wales population as these data uh, represent uh, that to poorly to the 81 years for the general New South Wales population. And they're clearly also below that for uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples living in New South Wales. The comparative mortality figures are way higher, particularly for those in midlife. And the causes of death are ones that you see commonly in the community, but with an excess of deaths particularly around nervous, nervous system causes uh, and diseases of the respiratory system and infections uh, because the population seems to be prone to those sort of deaths. When we looked at potentially avoidable deaths in this population, we saw that these were way in excess uh, of that experience in the New South Wales population as a whole. So 38% of all deaths were able to be classified as potentially avoidable for this group. And they're dominated by cardiovascular infections, uh, sorry, cardiovascular diseases, infections, cancer, and others. And particularly when we think of population health, um, uh, preventative health needs, these are things, many of these deaths are things that we can do something about. And so we need to be thinking about access to preventative health care for this group. We also looked at factors related to death that were associated with death. Not surprisingly, in multivariate analyses, age was. Uh, a feature, chronic conditions were a feature, but highlighted here is the strong association between serious mental illness requiring admission to hospital and risk of death. Uh, and you see here that the hazard ratio was over four for those who'd experienced an admission for a serious mental health disorder, suggesting a real strategic link, I think, and how we might be able to address health needs of people with intellectual disability and mental health conditions in preventing deaths. So what's been the utility of these deaths data? Well, firstly, of course, as uh, an academic department, we publish peer review articles, but that's not before the content of those and the nature of what we should be saying about those deaths has been discussed with people with intellectual disability. A lived experience reference group uh, reviewed the results of the research and articulated what they would like done with those results. The results were able to be used in advocacy in partnership with people with disability and um, advocates uh, to represent the data uh, to state and Commonwealth ministers and government departments, and were used in print and TV uh, news media. They're also used to, uh, as, as a springboard to host national and international roundtables in discussions and input into policy, including the uh, new um, national uh, preventative health policies. Uh, and they've been used by the regulatory and reporting agencies, such as the NDIS Quality and Safeguards Commission and the New South Wales Ombudsman. Uh, now, the, the Quality and Safeguards Commission is currently uh, determining how it will uh, review and report on deaths in the disability sector. And so this has been something that's been very useful. It's also been useful uh, to present to the Royal Commission and to the, re, uh, to the current Senate committee that's inquiring into autism. Uh, we've also noted a peculiarity with desk coding for this population in that 
not infrequently, intellectual disability is listed as a cause of death. If you remember earlier when I defined or said what the definition of intellectual disability uh, was, of course, you'd see that it's illogical that uh, such a definition could be used as a cause for death. Uh, so we've argued strongly that uh, coding, uh, cause of death coding should be revised to make sure that intellectual disability is no longer an appropriate option to choose as a cause of death. Our further mortality work uh, that is planned currently is to look at uh, cause of death from in-depth reviews conducted by the New South Wales Ombudsman to routine reporting by ABS, uh, to look at cause specific death rates, to understand the link between complex support needs, mental illness and mortality, given what we saw as a signal from the data, to look at end of life care and palliative care, and to work further with the NDOS Quality and Safeguards Commission to uh, inform the work that they're doing around uh, preventing deaths in disability care. Just moving on to some of our broader projects, if I could perhaps highlight a number of different domains here. Firstly, in the mental health domain, some of the work that we're doing, because if you remember the uh, cohort linkage uh, included a, a large group of people with mental ill health in New South Wales, we're able to, we've been able to look at healthcare and people with serious mental illness and people with dementia. We've been able to do some projects related to deliberate self-harm and drug and alcohol use disorders. We've been able more recently to look at inpatient mortality and cause of death. We've been able to look at predictors of representation to emergency department and inpatient stay after first presentation with a mental health concern, as I illustrated earlier. We've also been conducting some work with some neurological, some specific neurological disorders. We've particularly looked at the health and mental health needs of people with motor neuron dis, uh, disease. We've been looking at admissions for people with epilepsy more recently, the physical health needs of people with dementia and self-harm in people with dementia, and predictors of referral to residential aged care, a particular concern for younger people uh, as they uh, are discharged sometimes from hospital to residential aged care. And that work has been in partnership with the Summer Foundation. In terms of the work within the developmental disorder uh, group, we've looked at cause of death and mortality in people with intellectual disability. We're looking at cancer and end of life care. As I said, we've looked at the Ombudsman's data and compared it to the traditional coding. Now, the Ombudsman data is interesting because it uh, the cause of death is arrived at after someone has received a very detailed death review. And so, of course, comparing the results of that with the results from traditional standardised coding uh, helps us understand the value add of in-depth death reviews for that group. Uh, and we've recently submitted that work for publication. We've also looked at the mortality and cause of death uh, on, in people uh, with autism spectrum disorders. Uh, which has shed a really interesting light, particularly on the risk of accidents, uh, injuries and poisonings uh, in those with autism without intellectual disability. And it's in keeping with the very high risk of death from suicide in that population. We've looked at hospitalisation and potentially preventable hospitalisations in people with intellectual disability, cost of acute care, and I'll go on to describe some of our other portals that we've developed uh, with the data. More recently, we've been looking at whether or not people with intellectual disability are recognised in the different data sets and what that means. Uh, remembering that earlier that I said that people are labelled for particular purposes, we've been struck by the lack of agreement uh, between those data sets. So where one person, where a person is identified as having an intellectual disability in one data set, they're often not identified in the other data set. And that's a cause of concern. We've been arguing that we should have a standardised or universal identifier of people with intellectual disability in the relevant data sets. So this should be uniform across sectors. The key driver, driving reason for that is that unless we identify who has an intellectual disability in our services systems, we don't necessarily provide them with reasonable adjustments to make it possible for a person to engage, for example, in their healthcare uh, during their admission for, to hospital. We've more recently been looking at the justice system data and the impact of uh, the, the proportional representation of people with intellectual disability in prisons and the impact of disability services receipt on recidivism. And we've been looking at interactions between mental health and disability services receipts 
in partnership with the Telethon Kids Institute, Helen Leonard, Jenny Burke, Jenny Downs. Uh, we've looked at gastrostomy in people with intellectual disability, and even more recently, the impact of sex or gender on access to services in the mental health sphere for people with intellectual disability. I'd like to highlight a couple of points of innovation at this point. Uh, the first of those is a portal that we developed for local health districts in New South Wales. We thought uh, that we had access to this rich data set, but as researchers alone, that access wasn't doing uh, the job that it needed to do. So we thought, how can we make the data available in an aggregated manner that enabled local health districts to appreciate that they had to do a lot more capacity building in this area across the whole of their services, whether that was outpatients, inpatient mental health, inpatient non-mental health, uh, or whatever domain it was, or emergency departments. So we took our data and we developed this interactive web portal that we made available only to key service planners within local health districts so that they could think about how they were going to uh, improve their services. And this is an example of uh, just a screenshot from uh, one, uh, one piece of data. But what we've done is created a portal where you can look at the local population uh, with intellectual disability within your local health district and understand the population profile in detail. We've looked at uh, a tool that we've embedded in the tool, the ability for the local health district team to see the diagnoses that people are admitted with to see the frequency and the cost associated with admissions and emergency department presentations and uh, ambulatory mental health use, and to benchmark those uh, aspects to like LHD. So if you're in a metro area to a, a similar metro areas in New South Wales, or if you're a rural local health district to a rural local health district. And then we've embedded within the tool uh, examples of imp practice improvement. So, okay, you've observed that your admission rates are much higher uh, in your local health district for people with intellectual disability compared to other local health districts. These are some of the things that you can do about it. Um, so this is the sort of data that we're able to uh, show local health districts. That it's rich, it's interrogable, it's interactive, and so that you can run various reports and uh, see various um, ways of the data being represented. And this makes it, I think, uh, a useful uh, population health planning tool. Uh, and to my knowledge, uh, uh, this is um, the only such tool that I'm aware of for uh, this population. So I think one of the downsides is it's historical data, uh, but we are interested in seeing what the next generation of data tools could look like uh, that might help build further capacity. In partnership with uh, Philippa Kanamola, we uh, looked at a local government data um, resource. So this uh, link here that you're able to click on is an interactive uh, local government area tool uh, that enables you to visualize the data on the population of people with intellectual disability living with a local, within local government areas for the purposes of local government planning. Uh, we thought this was a really useful uh, use of these data. And you can drill down and see a heat map of uh, population density and so on, uh, and interact with that and understand more in depth uh, for your particular local health, local government area. So what about the future finally? Well, our own work is going to continue hopefully in the three key broad cohort areas in people with developmental disability, people with neurological disorders, and people with mental health issues. We think we need to move from a focus on uh, the outcomes that are often core for some of these cohorts to a focus on prevention and looking at continuity of care and clinical care pathways and thinking about how we can use the data to inform optimization of those, of those clinical care pathways and optimization of access to healthcare, which is a major problem for some of the groups that uh, we interact with. We are also uh, developing more capacity in terms of our end of life care and palliative care work. Uh, we are fortunate to have a Commonwealth Department of Health grant which is helping us to build a, a new model of palliative care for people with intellectual disability. And one of the things we feed in 
to uh, that uh, development of a service is what the linked data says about how and when people are accessing palliative care and how that differs uh, between people with and without intellectual disability. Of course, the project doesn't start with the big data. It starts with lived experience and it starts with consultation of the services sector, of people with intellectual disability, their families and carers to determine the, what the shape and feel of a palliative care service should look like and how we adjust practice to better meet the needs of this group. We're using the data to inform but not drive a clinical pathways tool through mental health services. So taking the data we know about where the gaps are and using that to develop a web tool to enable people with disability, those who support them and mental health services uh, develop clinical pathways through each component of their mental health service. We've been using the data to evaluate newly funded services in New South Wales. We're fortunate to have a number of uh, capacity building projects and newly funded services uh, and data is being captured regarding occasions of service. And we are doing the data linkage aspects of that evaluation and uh, UNSW Social Policy Research Centre is doing the bulk of the work around lived experience and the consumer experience uh, in evaluation of those services. We're working richly with government regulatory authorities to um, understand how we make um, changes in response to the linkage. And I have an ongoing role with the National Disability Data Advisory Committee, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, next. Some of you may have heard of a new development uh, of a national disability data asset, which I think is a really potential rich resource for people with disability, for those who support them in the services sector, for regulatory agencies and for researchers. I'm grateful that these slides have been um, prepared by uh, the team at the NDDA uh, and I thank uh, Francis. Uh, 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 I thank let me get it right, Frances Foster Thorpe, for her and her team's input into uh, these slides. Uh, they're beautifully presented. The NDDA is an enduring data asset aimed to improve the inclusion and opportunity for people uh, with disability living in Australia. What excites me about this project is that essentially it's the third generation iteration of a data asset. Somehow researchers uh, have lagged behind in terms of being able to access uh, data. It, it's been, I've seen a rapid change in the limited time in the last um, 12 years that I've been involved in linkage work. Uh, we've seen first generation uh, data assets, second generation uh, now, and we're moving into this phase of third generation, enduring multiple domain, multiple jurisdiction, pre-approved data asset with a really streamlined process and a distributed data asset. Now, I'll just try and describe what that looks like. Firstly, uh, we need to understand this is a big task and that the first task is actually working out um, whether or not a future national disability data asset is appropriate. And that decision, that final decision hasn't yet been made. So we're in a, essentially a, a piloting phase and a concept design and development phase, but it's required extensive collaboration across a number of national and state jurisdictions, as illustrated on this uh, slide. And uh, overseeing that has been input from people with disability in the sector and the National Disability Data Advisory Council, which has been a consultation group uh, that has assisted this work. We are here, but this work began some time ago with the National, uh, sorry, the Australian Data and Digital Council, uh, conceptualising this as a good idea uh, ministers agreeing to a pilot and putting funding toward that aim. And in the meanwhile, the pilots commencing and linkage commencing and data um, analytics capability are being developed. Toward the end of this year, there'll be a ministerial decision on whether to build this enduring data asset. Another thing that really excites me is the range of data sets that are initially going to be um, embedded within the NDDA. You can see all of these um, broad domains covering health, mental health, child development, uh, child protection and family supports, education, housing, employment, justice, aged care, NDIS, transport, higher education. Uh, this is a really potentially rich source of data that researchers like 
myself only dream of getting access to. Essentially, if this project uh, has forward um, support, it will become the largest and most comprehensive human data, human services data set ever assembled in Australia. And it will be able to shed light on uh, the outcomes uh, and services uh, for people with intellectual disability. You can see here that outcomes are going to be measured across a range of domains relevant to the lives of people with disability. But also we must remember that information about quality of life and individual experience is also going to be embedded within this. So it's not just administrative data that's being captured, but real um, outcome and experience data that is being built into this tool. Why is this important? Well, just think of the health and wellbeing domain for a moment. Health and wellbeing are dependent on a range of different uh, supports uh, in our society. Things like housing, uh, being engaged in choice, uh, preventable hospitalisation, stress, anxiety, time in prison, food security and diet, physical access to health services, accessibility and inclusive health services, and connectedness and belonging all might have an impact on health and well-being. So we need essentially lots of data being linked in together to tell us um, or give us information about each of the relevant data sources or data points that may have a bearing on health and health outcomes. This is really hard to do and we've tried to do this in our own clumsy way, trying to link multiple different data sets across different jurisdictions but of course, as you've seen from my illustration, it's a clumsy, awkward and lengthy process with a lot of investment in both time and dollars. And uh, ultimately a rich data source is created. But what better to have one overarching, uh, um, enduring asset with a governance and pre-approved uh, uh, data work that can be used for, for many different purposes. The current uh, technical vision is to link all of these data uh, via a network, networked approach and ultimately a distributed linkage. But the first step is uh, to work together um, to, with each of the data sets that needs to be brought in to ensure that the data can be linked, to ensure that each of the relevant domains are able to be included, to ensure that the relevant piloting is done to ensure feasibility and to determine the issues of governance. Developing agreements over the established uh, asset uh, will be uh, absolutely critical. And finally, uh, we are in this phase here of co-design of the uh, NDDA. This is a really important um, aspect of design. There are a series of co-design workshops, surveys, targeted consultations, and council meetings and decisions that will shape the look and the feel and the access to these data. The advisory council provides input and I've listed here, or I've had listed here for me, the members of the advisory council chaired by the Commonwealth Disability Discrimination Commissioner, Dr. Ben Gauntlet, uh, and consisting of a number of people with uh, interest uh, and expertise in uh, uh, this area. Um, <clears throat> and you can find out more about the National Disability Data Asset by visiting the website or by a direct um, email inquiry if you wish. So in conclusion now, linked data I think uh, has great utility as one component of a broader inclusive mixed methods research program. It's a powerful tool particularly for population who populations who experience health inequality who might be difficult to reach or identify in services systems for the reasons I've illustrated. The powerful approach in my view is an inclusive research approach with a really strong knowledge translation strategy to maximize the impact of the work. Uh, I think researchers can sometimes exist in uh, isolation and uh, obviously fulfill uh, and do very good work that leads to peer review publications. But more and more we're being um, uh, advised by the community that they want research to be relevant and to be useful. And this ensures that uh, these, th these uh, expectations are met. 
And as I've highlighted, the major barriers to planning and execution of the sorts of multi-agency linkages that we've been involved with, I think will improve with time. And I'm very hopeful that a resource like the National Disability Data Asset will be one of those key, key pieces of work uh, that will ensure that we can uh, improve this process with time. So I'll finish there and I'll thank you uh, for your um, time. And I think I'm going to have some questions that might be fielded by Felicity. Yes, thank you so much, Julian. That's a fantastic presentation and overview of an enormous amount of work that you and your team have been doing over the years. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Cheryl and the AHW, who, from someone who comes from a data linkage infrastructure uh, background, the amount of work that they've done to bring those data sets together is um, really incredible. So thank you to you all. Um, yes, yeah, so we're very happy to take some questions now. So if you have questions, please type them into the question and answer box. Um, but maybe I will start with the first question. Um, obviously, to do this work and also to ensure the impact of all of this fabulous research, you've needed to build really good relationships with governments. And I wondered whether you could give um, some more tips or advice to researchers who are looking to try and do, have similar things and have similar levels of impact about how do you build relationships with government? Thank you for the question. From the get go, uh, my position was blessed with good connections, particularly to the previous New South Wales disability services through family and community services, because the position was essentially funded at, by them to build capacity. So that gave us a good start with great connections to the disability sector, uh, and then connections with mental health developed. I, I've been a long-term employee of New South Wales Health and had some connectivity to the ministry itself, but that developed over time. Uh, one of the things we found most beneficial was bringing together people uh, under a NHMRC partnerships grant and most of the agencies, if not all of the agencies, in fact, in the initial uh, linkages, including linkage two and three, were partners in that NHMRC grant. That work enabled us to be at the table, to be discussing how we could use the data, to be having agreement ahead of us uh, in putting in an ethics application. Uh, and, and negotiating with the individual data custodians. So that made it very much easier, but that's a lot of groundwork to be doing uh, ahead of, ahead of um, access to the data. Great. So we've got our first question in and um, it's from Stuart Kinner who says, thanks for a fantastic presentation. Uh, can you please tell us a bit more about your work in the justice system? Does this include both adults in prison and children, adolescents in contact with the use justice system and then specifically are you able to comment on the impact of excluding people in custody from day-to-day -day care under the NDIS on continuity of care and associated health outcomes? Thank you Stuart. The uh, issue uh, with our data sets is it's linked to adult prisons and adult adult custody setting at the moment. Uh, our newly planned linkage, linkage 5, will have the whole age range and will include uh, data that relates to both offending and being a victim of crime, as well as data related to custodial sentences. But at the moment, all we have is data relating to people in prisons, and we're able to clearly identify those with intellectual disability in adult prisons only. Uh, so I hope that um, helps there. Uh, in terms of the impact of the NDIS on excluding uh, on, on, on health outcomes and it, where, where people are excluded from accessing, I think that is a really difficult issue. And it's, uh, you know, I guess essentially it's the way the funding traditionally has, uh, has um, uh, or the support in prison has traditionally run that one, if you're in prison, you're within that compartment that doesn't get access to those broader um, funding streams and supports. Uh, we do know that uh, of the adults in prison with intellectual disability compared to those without, uh, that the health needs are much higher, the mental health needs are much higher, and the chronic conditions are much higher. And so I'd expect naturally that once someone is out of prison, the uh, health supports that someone requires would be much higher. But I don't have any information about 
the impact of exclusion from NDIS uh, on those health outcomes. We don't have NDIS flags in our data set. Uh, very early on, I sought to try and establish uh, uh, those data sets within our um, linked data, and the capability wasn't there. This is something we'll be able to see with the new national disability data asset, should it be uh, a future asset. Uh, next question is, on your slides on data on local government areas, can you briefly tell us how this is done? What data do you require to present it according to local government area? So we're presenting the data in local government area uh, by age and by, sorry, by age band and by sex for each local government area. And so essentially uh, we're presenting that as a proportion of uh, the local population, uh, as well as a proportion of the overall state's population. So they're the ways that that data is represented. You will have access to those slides and feel free to uh, click on that interactive Google map that's been set up by Philippa and her team at UTS. That's a very useful way of just have, taking a look at that. The, the sole purpose was really just to help local government areas have a, um, an awareness of uh, people with intellectual disability living locally uh, and uh, the ability to respond to uh, people uh, living within those areas. There's remarkable variability in the proportion of the population with intellectual disability living within local government areas. We were struck by the very high proportions in some particularly uh, remote or rural um, local government areas. And so that's important if you know that you can potentially anticipate needs uh, and have uh, design inclusive communities more readily. Next question is about the NDDA. What would a governance structure that enables an enduring asset like the NDDA look like? Yeah, look, I think that's a really good question that's yet to be shaped. I don't know the answer. And I think as time goes on and consultations occur, we'll have a a clear understanding of the government structure. I do know that from the point of view of a researcher trying to access these multiple data sets, uh, that it has been um, a really difficult process because naturally uh, data custodians need to ensure data is used responsibly, ethics committees likewise. Uh, but my hope is that the structures will be far simpler than they are now. Uh, I think, uh, but obviously the, the principles behind uh, the governance uh, will be um, adhered to rigorously. So uh, I think it will be a rigorous process, but actually a much more streamlined process than we have at present. Great. I think we've probably got time for one more question, which I think is going to come from me. You mentioned that you have a lived experience reference group, and I wondered whether you could give us a bit more detail about how that worked and what exactly do they do? Yes, so with each of the key projects, we have a specific lived experience reference group. So for example, uh, the project relating to younger, uh, to uh, people referred to residential aged care, we have people who've been referred to residential aged care who uh, engage with our research, help us shape the research question, help interpret the data and so on. Uh, likewise, for uh, the partnership grant that I referred to, that uh, we had a lived experience group who uh, met, we met with regularly. We um, shared initial ideas for the, the, the project and the, the grant. Uh, we developed that uh, material. Then with each pro individual project, uh, those individuals were supported to engage with the um, preliminary results of the research, comment on their, and in, their interpretation, share their interpretation of what that meant for them, and also share what they wanted to do. So, um, in, within a, a group of people with intellectual disability, people have varying levels of ability. Some people will be able to read and write and be able to um, engage with um, uh, easy read information that we present that's pictorial or plain English. Others will need uh, much more support in order to engage and so that they would uh, also have a support person who is able to uh, lead them through that engagement process. Uh, and then the engagement process is determined according to the person's preference. We have sometimes a group meeting and then sometimes we'll meet individually one-on-one -on -one with that person and their support person. So it's, it's, uh, the model is flexible. 
uh, and it's determined by both the project and the types of participants we have. We're really fortunate just recently to have had our, uh, to have employed uh, our first uh, person with intellectual disability in the department as a core staff member. Uh, up till now, we've just had to uh, fund uh, the participation of people with lived experience through the grants themselves but we've now been able to um, assemble enough funding to have someone employed on staff with us. And that's uh, been a, a logistic challenge with human resources at a university, but a really worthwhile development. Um, I would just highlight the complexities of that process. Uh, there was a long delay whilst uh, oddly we had to um, receive permission from the Anti-Discrimination Commission to employ someone with disability. Uh, so if you're advertising a position, whether it's uh, excluding or including a person specifically with disability, you need explicit exemption from that process. We're a bit shocked by that. Uh, the, the role couldn't have been fulfilled by anyone other than a person with disability. Uh, but nevertheless, that's a process that we had to go through. Uh, we're really super excited that that's happened. Wow, that's fantastic. Well, I think we need to end there. Our time is up. Thank you so much, Julian. That was a fantastic presentation and I'm sure that everybody learnt a lot from that. And um, hopefully we will privilege. hear from you again sometime. And the final thing I need to do is just let everybody know that our next webinar will be on the 23rd of June and Professor David Preen from the University of Western Australia is going to be talking. So um, look that up and register uh, if you're interested in attending that one. Thank you.